follow hard. <laughs> okay, so we left off, so we finished off assembly as our last thing. Now we got to the, I kind of left you in suspense last week where I said, okay, we're about to get rid of viruses now from ourselves. So that's where we get to a release. So now the virus wants to get out of that cell so it can infect another cell. And of course, that's where it's going to, its ultimate goal is to do that so it can start the whole process over with absorption and you know start the whole infection process again. So if you're a non-enveloped or naked virus, you're going to cause the whole cell to just burst open and replicate so many viruses, it just swells up and pops like a overfilled balloon. If you're an envelope virus, you take a kind of different strategy. So you're going to exit by a process called budding off. Basically, it has its advantages because you're going to have a slower release. You don't alert the immune system like, hey, things are going crazy right now. You kind of just go behind under the radar. So when that happens, basically, you'll have the matrix material already lined up. You'll have the spikes in the envelope. You'll have the nucleocapsid that comes up along there, and then it basically just binds, and that triggers this membrane to form a balloon. And it'll just keep swelling up, and eventually this will just fluff off from there. And sometimes the virus also encodes for enzymes that help in this process, like influenza when we talk about the flu. It brings its own enzyme that is very important for this actual process. So it makes it or close for an enzyme that will actually cut this thing off so it can more easily escape. So this is kind of pretty normal when you have an envelope virus, you'll see this kind of thing happening from the cell membrane where there's just slow release instead of say a few hundred viruses being released all at once. That has the advantage of like the mass thing, like those those flash mob, so that's, when you have lysis, that's sort of like the flash mob. All of a sudden, everyone starts dancing around and getting excited. So, envelope viruses, they're more like one person goes and kind of just does a moonwalk across, and then another one does that, so it's kind of slower. And that goes on for a longer period of time also, so that can go on for several days until the whole cell eventually just runs out of nutrients and energy. So when that happens, the whole cell's gonna die from accumulated damage. Just basically, it runs out of membrane, doesn't have enough proteins around to do its own functions, it's not making enough ATP, but that can be three or four or five days even that it's just been flooding off a few dozen viruses a day. Things that can be affected when we talk about accumulated damage. So you can have effects on metabolism, you just don't make ATP enough, gene expression where the normal proteins that need to be made for just daily activities of the cell aren't being made. The cell membrane is just running out because things are budding off, but there's no making of new, pro new membrane. And then organelles like eukaryotic cells have endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, all of that is also being deprived of its function. So, wrap up everything about viruses and animal viruses before we jump into bacteria papers, which are also pretty cool. But this is like a five minute video, but well worth it. Animal viruses vary based on the type of nucleic acid they possess, as well as whether they are naked or enveloped. Each variance results in different types of life cycles. A naked and an envelope virus will attach to and penetrate a host differently. Animal viruses without an envelope are referred to as naked viruses. They bind to the surface of the host cell and inject their DNA into the host cell in a manner similar to bacteriophages. Some envelope viruses infect their host by binding to receptors on the host cell. The envelope of the virus then merges with the host membrane and the capsid enters the cell. After entry, the capsid opens and releases the viral genetic material into the cytoplasm of the cell. Upon attachment, some envelope viruses infect their host by inducing phagocytosis, in which the host cell envelops the viral envelope and absorbs the virus into its cytoplasm.
When the virus has entered the cell, the outer and inner part of the envelope merge together and the capsid is released into the cytoplasm. At this point, the capsid opens up and releases the viral genetic material into the host cell cytoplasm. The type of nucleic acid in an animal virus will determine how the viral nucleic acid and proteins are synthesized. When the single-stranded DNA genome of a parvovirus enters a host cell and invades its nucleus, a complementary strand is produced for the single-stranded viral DNA. This DNA is then replicated normally. Messenger RNA is transcribed and transported into the cytoplasm, where viral capsimer proteins are produced. At some point after synthesis has begun, the capsimer proteins enter the nucleus of the host, and the virions containing the original single-stranded DNA are assembled. In a virus with double-stranded DNA in its genome, the DNA also migrates to the nucleus, where it's replicated by the host enzymes in the same way that the host's DNA is normally replicated. Messenger RNA is made from the viral DNA in the nucleus, and viral capsimer proteins are made in the cytoplasm from the messenger RNA. The capsimer proteins enter the nucleus, and the virions are assembled in the host nucleus. After assembly, the virions accumulate in the cytoplasm and prepare for release from the host cell. Some viruses have a single-stranded RNA genome that can act directly as messenger RNA. This strand is called the positive strand or sense strand RNA. This messenger RNA is read by host ribosomes to make viral proteins. The virus carries a unique RNA polymerase that makes a complementary negative strand, also called an antisense strand, from the original positive strand. There is no known animal equivalent of this RNA-dependent polymerase. The negative strand RNA can act as a template for a more positive strand RNA. Positive strand single-stranded RNA viruses are assembled in the cytoplasm of the host cell when the RNA and the proteins have all been produced. Viruses with single-stranded negative sense RNA are in a special situation. Their RNA will not act as messenger RNA until it's been transcribed into the positive sense strand complement of the original negative anti-sense strand RNA. To accomplish this feat, the viruses carry their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which transcribes the RNA into the positive strand. When the positive strand has been produced, it acts as the template for both protein synthesis and more negative strand RNA. When the virion is packaged, it must contain the negative strand RNA in addition to copies of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. When double-stranded RNA viruses infect a host cell, the positive, sense strand of the RNA acts as a messenger RNA for protein production. One of the proteins coded is an RNA polymerase that uses the negative strand to make more positive strand RNA. The positive strand also acts as a template to make more negative strand RNA. The two strands come together and are packaged along with the polymerase in the virion. Retroviruses make up a special class of positive strand RNA viruses. When a retrovirus infects a cell, its positive strand RNA is reverse transcribed into a DNA negative strand by a viral reverse transcriptase. This negative strand DNA is further transcribed to double-stranded DNA, which serves as a template for the viral RNA genome. This positive strand RNA also serves as the template for viral protein synthesis. The reverse transcriptase is packaged with the mature virion as it's essential for the successful reproduction of the virus. Just like the beginning of the life cycle, naked viruses differ from enveloped viruses in how they assemble and release. Naked viruses generally leave their host cell by accumulating to such numbers that the cell lyses, 
spilling virions into the extracellular medium, free to infect new hosts. This kills the host cell and generally causes inflammation and infection in the tissue where the host cell is found. Envelope viruses leave the host cell by merging with one of the cell's membranes, the nuclear membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the cytoplasmic membrane. During synthesis, some viral glycoproteins are embedded in cellular membranes, and these glycoproteins act as a recognition system for the viral capsid. The cell membrane surrounds the capsid and forms a bud on the outer surface of the cell, which pinches off and forms a protective envelope for the virus, which is then free to infect other host cells. An advantage of the envelope is that the virus does not need to break the cell to be released, so the cell can stay alive longer while it continues to produce and bud off more viruses. The type of nucleic acid, along with the presence or absence of an envelope, will determine the type of life cycle a given animal virus will have. Phagocytosis in this video is the same thing as endocytosis that I talked about earlier. And also, of course, in all of these options, no matter what, you still have to make positive sense RNA if you need to make proteins. So no matter what it starts off as, what it needs to go back and forth as, you only can use positive sense to make proteins. And the ribosome still can only read from the pi prime end. Okay. So, that's the basic phases or stages of an animal viral infection. A little bit more about animal viruses, and then we'll go into bacteriophages, which have their own coolness going on. But the entire life cycle of a virus is gonna be measured in hours, and it can be really short, like eight hours, and it already replicates and causes the cell to burst open, or in some cases, greater than 72 hours, and that's virus specific. Just like when we talked about, like, replication in bacteria and you know how what's the how often does binary fission happen so generation time in that case sometimes it was as short as say 10 minutes in other cases it was several hours same kind of thing with the, depending on what virus it is some viruses cause the host cell to replicate them really quick and they get out of there within a few hours others take a long time when we say a virion, so a virion is just going to be an extracellular virus particle, so when it's actually outside of a cell, still virulent at that point, and it's able to establish infection if it comes in contact with some host cell that's susceptible. Eventually, if a cell is infected, it's either by gradual you know, budding off or by just all at once lysis, a cell's going to release a few thousand to over a hundred thousand viruses or virions per infected cell. And of course, some of that is dependent on the type of cell that's being infected. Some cells are obviously bigger than others, so they can produce more viruses. And of course, the health of the cell too, if it's already generally you know, infected with a virus, that the overall environment is, sets it up saying, oh, there's a virus infection in the area, maybe you should be ready for it. Then that virus is more resistant to that infection. When we talk about cytopathic effects or CPEs, those are gonna be the actual damage that you can observe that's gonna be unique to viral infection. So you can actually, or a pathologist at least, if you're in a hospital, can say, hey, this is definitely a viral infection and not a bacterial infection or a fungal infection because some of these things only happen when you're infected by a virus. And this is when you look under the microscope and see, oh yeah, this is definitely a viral infection may not be able to tell, you know, just from symptoms that the patient's experiencing, but you get some of their sputum or a skin sample or something where they're infected, look at it under the microscope and tell me, wow, this is definitely a virus. One great example is the formation of syncytia. So this is a cool way viruses have figured out to go from one cell to another without going outside of a cell. That way the immune system can't notice that it's there. Basically, one cell gets infected, causes that cell to 
kind of bond with another cell and the membranes will actually fuse together. And that way the virus can just go directly from one cell to another and it never has to actually cut off. It doesn't have to cause the cell to lie. It doesn't have to be exposed to your immune system. So that was the fun of animal virus. Now we get into bacteriophages. This might be the thing that saves you from dying from a bacterial infection sometime in the future. Here, note some of these trials to see if this actually works. And it has saved a few people actually where there's antibiotic resistant forms of bacteria. There's nothing that actually works. And then they'll try experimental trials with bacteriophages. Of course, they're eventually going to have to figure out how to get the bacteriophage to be able to kill the virus without your immune system wanting to get rid of the phage also. But that's not meant to be in us either. So there's always your immune system always wanting to get rid of everything foreign, including phages that may actually be there to save your life. Bacteriophage, they're often just called phages or phages. They're just viruses that are going to specifically infect bacteria. And like when we talked about transduction in 2.3, so they're very specific to the type of bacteria they're going to infect. Phage specifically is going to mean eat in Greek, so they're eaters of bacteria. They can provide virulent factors also, that's where we talked about generalized and specialized transduction. When you want to grow up viruses in a lab, you wouldn't do like just spread them on other media like you do with bacteria. Instead, you have to actually have some type of cell that can be infected by the virus. So if you wanted to look at how many bacteria phages there are, you would create a bacterial lawn and then add some of these phages in solution and you actually look for clearing. Basically the opposite of the colonies that we look for normally to say, oh, there's this many bacteria or colony forming units. Instead, you look for these clearings and then you use the assumption that every clearing started off with one virus infecting one cell and then it spread to the neighboring cells and eventually created a clearing that you can see with your naked eye. Here's the coolness of viruses when it comes to bacteriophages. So they can have this kind of shape. The animal viruses don't have this coolness or this shape. Great example is the ones that infect E. coli, our friend from lab, but they have the same basic structure no matter what the page is. Basically, you start off with DNA, and phages are always going to start off as DNA viruses. They'll have that in an icosahedral capsid. You remember the shapes of the head. Icosahedral, and what's the other type? Crickets. They really look like this, though, with legs and everything? Yeah. If you're not icosahedral, you're... Oh, you're that ball one. Looks like a soccer ball. Helix, uh, something right? So that's actually helical. It's, this is icosahedral, this is soccer ball. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, helical is going to be the rod shape. So okay. Do what? Yeah, icosahedral is the, the other type. So coming off of that then are these unique tail fibers. And when we talked about spikes with animal viruses, these are basically those spikes, but they form this cool spider-like shape. So it has DNA in the capsid, then there's a collar region, then there's this sheath, and then there's tail fibers coming off of that. And coming from this is going to be like a hypodermic needle that's going to inject the DNA into the virus. So if you're going to get infected by a phage then, you have the phage living cycle, so it's going to cause actual lysis, the bacterial cell is going to burst open. That's similar to how animal viruses do it, but there are some differences. So first stage is going to be attachment or absorption. Basically there's a recognition by these tail fibers that there's something to bind to on that bacteria. Just like when we said animal viruses can only infect certain cell types, Phages can only infect certain types of bacteria, and that's based on this kind of recognition. So there'll be specific receptors on the bacterial surface, and they'll bind to specific things on the viral tail fibers. And if the recognition doesn't occur, then they can't bind. Then you have penetration, that's our second stage. 
in this case now the page doesn't need to actually enter the whole bacterial cell the capsid doesn't need to go in there's none of that like you have an animal virus instead once it let those gel fibers come in contact to the receptors on the cell wall then it's basically going to penetrate the wall and inject the bacteriophage DNA into the bacterial cell. And then this is just going to stay attached as a hollow shell on top of the bacterial cell. Then we get to synthesis. So now you can... I know, we're starting to fall asleep. So with synthesis, now we want to insert the viral genome, <clears throat> makes the virus, bacteria do the same thing like when we had animal viruses infect us. So you want to tell the bacteria, quit making your own proteins, start making my viral proteins. So that's exactly what needs to happen. Now the host cell starts replicating the viral DNA, synthesizes the viral proteins, all of that taking over part is basically the same as like when we talked about animal viruses. Then, because capsomers always self-assemble, they don't need help from other proteins to put them all together, so once these capsomers get made during synthesis, they'll form the capsid, that I call sahedral head, the DNA gets inserted into that head, and then all these other components, like the tail fibers and the base plate and the collar and all those things that are unique to bacteriophages, those will also spontaneously fit together. They won't need any protein help from us either. They basically just fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. So if we're going through that then, here's those empty shells of the bacteriophages on the surface of the bacterial cell. Took over the cell after it inserted the DNA. Now all of these parts have been made, now they all just need to fit together. And that's exactly, they'll just keep bouncing around and they're usually in high enough concentration that eventually they're going to come together in just the right fit because there's so many of them in a small space. Eventually you make one of these and then of course they can start the whole process over. When we get to release now, the bacterium gets packed full of pages. Eventually the whole thing ruptures by lysis. There's no budding off of these. There's no such thing as an enveloped bacteriophage. It's all just naked viruses. When an E. coli bacterium gets infected, it averages about 200 virions that it can produce and then it bursts open and releases those 200 and they can infect more cells. There's viral enzymes that are usually encoded that can help weaken that cell envelope. So weaken the membrane and the wall. Remember, if say it's a gram negative or a gram positive, it still has a wall. And that wall is usually a rigid structure. So to get that to burst takes a little more energy. But if you can form some cracks in that wall and kind of weaken it up, then it's more likely to burst open. That rupturing is what's called lysis. And that's going to be the end result of if you go into the living cycle. Virions get released, get out in the open environment, and now they can infect more cells. And of course, you know, when there's one back E. coli, there's probably thousands or millions more, so they can easily latch onto another E. coli cell and start the process over. I hand drew these images in Microsoft Paint. Yeah, <laughs> Paint has its advantages. Old school, but it's totally worth it. That one too? Yeah. <laughs> but I bet if I had enough time, I could. So, first, a little bit about virulent bacteriophages. Virulent phages carry out a simple life cycle called the lytic cycle. The phage attaches to the host cell during the attachment stage and then penetrates the host cell and injects its DNA during the penetration stage. After penetration, the phage causes the host DNA to break into small pieces. The phage then uses the host machinery to synthesize new copies of its DNA. This process is part of the biosynthesis stage. Biosynthesis also involves production of viral proteins. Once biosynthesis is complete, the phage components are assembled into virions during the maturation or assembly stage. In the release stage of the lytic cycle, the cell lyses, releasing the phage virions. These released phages go on to infect other cells.
get all that form feeling in this thing. It's okay. How long um, from when it first attaches and injects its DNA, how long does that cycle take to complete? Like before they go out and type So a lot of times that's in that shorter period, like eight hours, is enough to cause that whole thing to happen. Unless you're gonna do what I'm about to talk about. So sometimes it doesn't want to just get the cell to replicate it and get out of there. Sometimes it's like, hey, I could just hang out with this bacteria, and every time the bacteria go through binary fission, I get coffee also. So not all phages are going to go immediately into the living cycle. But they do it happens quickly. And it can grow really quick actually. But as quick as you can get DNA into RNA into proteins, that's how quick you can get this cell to rupture. But there are some specific DNA phages that will go through attachments, they'll go through penetration, get their DNA into the cell. But things are kind of peachy at that time. So they don't need to start synthesis, assembly, and release right away. They say, hey, if these bacteria are happy, why don't we latch onto them? kind of replicate our cells every time the bacteria replicate. So these phages are called temperate phages because their intensity is kind of reduced or moderated. So they're, you know, like temperate environments such as zones between the tropics and the polar ice caps, kind of the temperate regions, they're kind of moderate temperatures. So similarly, these phages have a temperate thing. They are the one to cause the cell to lyse right away. Instead, that viral DNA gets inserted into the bacterial chromosome as a form called the prophage. That parent cell now, the bacterial cell, doesn't know, realize it's infected, shows no signs of infection. That virus DNA just cuts itself in, sticks itself in there, and that's it. So now, that doesn't affect replication of the bacterial cell then. Every time the bacterial cell replicates, which still can be as quick as say 10 minutes for some cells, every time that happens, that prophage gets copied also because of course DNA replication, everything that's in the chromosome has to get copied. So as that happens, the virus also gets copied. So this is a different state than the lytics process. Here the state is called lysogeny and that's the phage lysogenic cycle that can be entered by these temperate phages. Yes, this is all phage drawing. So you have the phage attached onto the surface of this nice kind of square cell image. So attachment, penetration, where the DNA gets injected into the cell, but then there's this red form of DNA is going to insert into this blue circular chromosome. So now, every time the bacterial cell goes through binary fission, one to two, two to four, that piece of red DNA also gets copied along with that. And that stays the same during lysogeny until something stresses out that bacterial population. Until then, the bacteria, the, the virus says, hey, I'm just gonna ride along, it's a free ride. With high gas prices, that's kind of a thing you should want as a free ride. When you're in the lysogenic cycle, then something stresses out the bacteria. Antibiotic treatment, nutrient deprivation, change in pH, something does that. So now that DNA says, oh crap, my free ride's over. Someone caught me in action now. So it says the cell's kind of freaking out. It's currently stressed. I may not get copied this next time around. So at that time, it's going to cut its own DNA out of the chromosome now and continue the next three stages. So now it goes from the lysogenic cycle directly into the lytic cycle, starts synthesis, makes its own protein, assembles the capsid, the tail fibers, all of that, and gets out of there before things hit the fan. So, wrapping up pages. And this is only some phages that get to this, not all of them. Temperate bacteriophages carry out two types of life cycle, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. The lytic cycle for temperate bacteriophages is similar to the lytic cycle for virulent phages. The phage attaches to the host cell during the attachment stage 
and then penetrates the host cell and injects its DNA during the penetration stage. In temperate bacteriophages, the phage DNA forms a circle which can either replicate and be transcribed to produce phage components in the lytic cycle or can proceed to the lysogenic cycle. During the biosynthesis stage of the lytic cycle, the phage DNA directs the host cell to synthesize viral components. The phage components are assembled into virions during the maturation or assembly stage. In the release stage of the lytic cycle, the cell lyses, releasing the phage virions. These released phages can go on to infect other cells. Recall that temperate phages can proceed either to the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle shortly after penetration. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA integrates within the bacterial chromosome by recombination. The inserted phage DNA is called a prophage. Most of the phage proteins are repressed by two repressor proteins that are products of the phage genes. Whenever the bacterium reproduces, the prophage is also copied. The prophage is excised from the host chromosome in a process called induction. Induction can occur spontaneously through recombination or some other genetic event, or through the action of UV light or certain chemicals. At this point, the phage may enter the lytic cycle. So, whatever this stressor is, like that video said, it can also be UV light. It doesn't have to be a chemical or an antibiotic. It can be anything that goes and gets into the switch from the lysogenic process into the lytic process. But it's called induction because it's kind of inducing it to come out of the chromosome and go into that lytic cycle. So, that gets us through viruses. So, now we're ready for test physics exam. As soon as you get through 2.4 and 3.1, then you can, oh yeah, now I can know all about viruses, yay. And that's good stuff. Questions about viruses before we go into even more cool infection stuff and epidemiology. And of course, if you're one of those COVID health nurses, you can do epidemiology for a long time. <laughs> They know way more about it than probably I do. But they don't know about auger media, though. Three nurses. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> three nurses who yeah. It happens, apparently. <laughs> but they have seen it at least sometime in life. I would hope that. So, disease and epidemiology, and this is just